Okay, this is um, Cindy Luttrell and Rich Park, and um, we're looking at instructional rounds for teachers. Um, so I'm gonna share a little bit of information with you. Um, it's a real abbreviated form, but it'll give you a little bit of insight about the instructional rounds process. Um, so what are some of the challenges, Rich, that you know that teachers have in the classroom today? Uh, one thing is just keeping attention of all the students and uh, trying to do something that they find meaningful and relevant. And you're dealing with a, a broad range of students and different behavior levels, different family backgrounds, and that sort of thing. I would completely agree. And of course, there's lots of challenges, but you really hit on one that's real important. Um, and here's a quote that's from City Elmore Fireman title. And basically, the whole idea is that we're really, um, we have a lot of challenges in our schools, but basically, we're asking for us to educate all students to high levels. Um, but the problem with that is that everybody just really doesn't know how to do that. Um, we all want to, but we don't know how. So instructional rounds is the focus of this little presentation, and so I want to talk about how that might be used to address that situation. Um, so another question is, does every teacher really know how to implement best practice strategies? And um, obviously they don't all know how to do that, although they try to. Um, some of those strategies might be things like the 5E model of instruction, collaborative grouping, rigorous instruction, and high-level questioning strategies. So instructional rounds is really just a tool that people are beginning to use to increase teacher expertise and best practice strategies. Um, so what are the instructional rounds? Well, if we were face to face in a room together, I would ask you to look at some of these resources. And these are actually the resources that I use for this presentation, um, but adapted them for use with teachers. Um, originally, Richard Elmore from Harvard University has put together um, some research and some experiences in his book, Instructional Rounds in Education, but it wasn't really, the focus was not for teachers, it was for administrators. Now Marzano in his article talks about how this really might be a good idea for teachers. So after I read this and I heard of, I had a friend that had done it in one school district, I decided to give it a shot. And so this last year actually um, implemented instructional rounds in eight school districts and had just outstanding results. The teachers really enjoyed the process. Um, so what do instructional rounds do for teachers? And I, I kind of want to just give you a little input on it, but basically some of the things that they do is they help us to really in, improve student learning, take pockets of excellence to scale. We have teachers in our districts and every district that do just outstanding work with students. And so it helps us to bring that to everybody else. Um, breaks down the isolation of teaching because teaching is really an isolated field. I mean, you're kind of in your classroom and you do your own thing. Um, and, and I see Rich there shaking his head and everybody will agree that's what we do and you really don't know what's going on in other classrooms. So it kind of takes that away and, and opens that up. And then the whole idea of collaboration and working together is so powerful to help us to enhance our pedagogical skills. Basically, instructional rounds are based on the whole philosophy that was developed by David Hawkins um, of the Instructional Corps because what's an impact on us in learning is that instructional task that focuses around the interaction of the student, the teacher, and the content. The fundamentals of the round process is that first you identify a focus problem or a problem of practice, um, and we'll look at each one of these in more detail. Um, then you, the second thing after you identify your focus is you do observations, and these are not evaluative for evaluation purpose, it's for learning from other teachers, so teachers learning from teachers. Um, and then the third process step is the debrief, which is critical to the whole process, and then of course you need to talk about the next level of work. So um, we actually, in the schools that I worked with, the eight districts, we um, I asked them to have their first semester focus to be collaborative grouping and the second semester quality questioning, but I also asked them to have a personal focus um, because in the process I actually did rounds with a group of three to four teachers each time it was done and it happened multiple times, but I wanted teachers to take ownership and really look for what they wanted to look for as well. So first you identify a focus. 
Um, and then the second thing that you do after you choose your focus is you really need to have guidelines um, because you're, what you do is you go into other people's classrooms, of course, with their permission. That's all set up ahead of time and all scheduled ahead of time. Lots of communication has to happen. Um, but you have to have guidelines for those observations. Um, it's real important not to disrupt or interrupt any more than you, can't, you have to. I mean, if three or four people walk into your classroom, um, with clipboards in their hands, it is a little bit of a disruption, but you know the students are talked to ahead of time to let them know that this is teachers learning from teachers, just like we ask them to learn from each other as well. Um, in Dr. Elmore's book, if you read it, he says it's fine to ask students questions when it's appropriate, but as a group we decided not to do that. Um, we were in there for 20 minutes and we just really decided that we were going to just stand at the back of the room and be quiet and record our observations. Um, so that was a choice. Don't you think, Rich, if you had a group of people coming in and they were talking to your students, that that would be a little bit disruptive? Uh, trying to keep the students focused, you bet. Uh, that would be a direct interruption of the classroom. It would. And so we really, we knew we were interrupting, but, you know, there that had to happen a little bit just to be in the classroom and so we yeah. tried real hard not to you know set our parameters so that we wouldn't disrupt any more than we had to um, and then another one that was real important to us as a group was not to talk about what we observed at any time except during the debrief time um, we didn't talk in the classroom of course we didn't talk in the hallways I mean students could walk by even when we took our lunch break we didn't talk because there could be parents there so just having that confidentiality was critical and even in the debrief we debriefed together about what we observed but we never talked to anybody else about that it didn't even go back to the original teacher because it was just our intent to learn from that person not to be in any type of evaluation role and then of course the final thing was you know is there anything else so you would want to talk with your group and see if there's anything else that you wanted to establish as a norm um, so once you establish these guidelines or norms, then you actually do the observations because that was the critical piece. And we did 20-minute observations in about four or five classrooms in the morning. And we would actually just watch for maybe collaborative grouping. But you'd be surprised. Every time you go into a classroom, you're going to pick up on different things. It kind of just depends, you know, on what you see in that classroom at that particular moment. It's just a little small snapshot of what's happening. So we just collected data. Um, after the observation, then we had the debrief, and the debrief um, had three steps, description, analysis, and prediction, but basically we went over our notes and talked about what we saw that maybe led us to learn something about collaborative grouping, strategies those teachers were using, things that we saw that were causing success in student learning. And so it was just, and, and it was not to be evaluative at all, it's not to be critical, but it was just to, to try to learn um, from what we saw in those classrooms. <clears throat> and then the next level of work, basically, and there's a lot of information here, but basically the whole thing was, what are we going to do with this? What did we learn? And at the end of our observations and our debrief, I would always ask everybody, what can you take back to your classroom and implement yourself? And everybody would always have something that they, they had learned and they were sharing, you know, sharing and excited about. Um, so that's kind of how the steps in the process worked. Um, as a reflection, um, we would want to just think about some of the things that we would have to do to set that up. Um, it, and then there is a, a lot of upfront work to, to actually get it set up. You have to have that administration support. Um, it has to be timed right. We learned real fast not to do much in the late spring because what happens in the late spring? We have uh, well, a standardized test of some sort. Of yes, it com completely overtakes the schools right now because of all the preparation and everything on that. So we Not to mention just the fact that it's spring and everybody's trying to get out of school. And exactly. The uh, first few six, six weeks, they know they got the last one whipped, and uh, so keeping control is difficult. Oh yeah, it, exactly. So the less interruptions at that time, and you know, yeah. it's it's really important. So. We, we realized that we did it twice during the year, once in the fall. Fall was not a problem, but in the spring, it had to be early, early, early in the spring semester to avoid that. So just a couple of resources to make it real practical. Um, there were supplies that we had to have, um, pretty simple. Um, the schedule was the biggest um, thing to get set up ahead of time, but there were just a few little things that we had to have. This is just a sample that was actually used in a school of how the schedule worked. We kind of just got ready at the beginning, 
um, 20 minute observations in uh, about four or five classrooms, took a nice lunch break, and then two hours to debrief. And it really does take about two hours to go over five classrooms wow. and talk about it. You'd be surprised when you go in with a group of people like that, um, everybody doesn't see the same thing. We, um, so, and then we always took a little thank you note to leave in the teacher's boxes. Um, thank you for letting us observe today. And we all signed that. And, you know, it's so nice for them to open up their classroom and let us come in for that. So did this kind of make sense to you? Um, well, I think what was important is how you're approaching the observational process without uh, being intrusive or threatening. Uh, you set that up in advance so teachers knew what to expect and were able to. Um, and you know what? And that worked out real effective for us, and partly because I'm not an evaluator either. You know, so I'm traveling with teachers, and none of us are in that evaluation mode. And so it's really opened things up. And I have some school districts that are continuing this process on their own. But um, I have administrators that wanted to be included and really discouraged that because um, it's, it's yep. just, you know, it's not an evaluation type situation. It's just learning, teachers learning from teachers. That, that, that's a good thing. I mean, I think we, we hear a lot of cliches of the way we classify teachers, but teachers should be considered a, a content expert and an education professional i mean that's what we're certified for exactly so how do you hone that how do you hone that skill and uh so many times i mean i know my classroom is such a threat uh, not a threat but it's it's hands-on and a skill-based class so just trying to keep everybody together and some people can't read and others are uh, programming on a college level so there's such a diversity of you're skills. exactly right and and a lot of teachers are really great at dealing with that and so it's great to be able to learn from each other so that, that, I think you've got a, a balance there and that's a, that's an ongoing uh, issue so well, I, I hope it works out for people people are trying it